minority leaders and with their consent. The chair announces that when the two houses meet in joint meeting to hear an address by his ex committee will come to order. President of the Republic of Korea, only the doors immediately opposite the speaker. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania for the purpose of offering an amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2309, offered by Mr. Meehan of Pennsylvania. I would ask unanimous consent the amendment be considered as read, and the gentleman is recognized to uh, speak on his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I know I am among many uh, on this committee who have worked and, and really care about trying to find a way where we can work together to get to a resolution uh, that, that deals with the reality uh, that we all face, which is the tremendous challenges uh, that the Postal Service faces uh, in a changing economy, but also looks to uh, appreciate the work that already has been done in trying to find a way to move forward in the most uh, effective manner. And as a result, I have worked through the language uh, in the substitute amendment before us and recommend uh, a, a few changes which I think may help to make this more palatable for numbers of our colleagues. First, just with respect to the oversight uh, as we move forward, building on the principle that the individuals who are there, the Board of Governors, the current management uh, who are dealing with this issue, be giving a window to continue to try to do it. I was struck by the language of the uh, authority, uh, which may be in place and, in fact, may need to be in place in, in order for there to be some kind of a real impetus for the existing management to deal with the issue. But I also believe that there needs to be an appropriate window in order to do this. And so my amendment would first allow the creation of a control board uh, as in accordance with the language in the bill, uh, but would create it in such a way that uh, they would only be triggered, uh, again, uh, according to uh, the provision that they are not able to operate with a deficit as in the board. But what it will do is give a two-year window that in the event the authority is called for in existence, there will be two years during which they will serve in an advisory capacity to the existing management as they continue to try to find a way to resolve the issues that we are dealing with. Second is appreciating that in the end here, one of the roadblocks to a resolution perhaps of the fact that there is going to be many more employees than, than may be needed is to appreciate moving forward the opportunity for that, the current management, uh, to be able to negotiate contracts that would not have the no layoff provisions in it, and also to claw back to the existing, the one existing contract and enable the Board to go back and renegotiate it so that the no layoff provision uh, not be part of the existing contract. That being said, I think it very important that as we move forward, we appreciate the long history and the importance of the collective bargaining process. We have heard many comments about it here today. And as a result, my bill would strike the language that is currently in this substitute amendment the language that is contained in Sections 204, B, 4, and 5, which would take away the authority for that controlling authority to be able to, uh, you know, to, be able to modify or terminate the existing collective bargaining agreements. This will enable labor and management to move forward in a fashion to which each is accustomed and in a way in which we are accustomed to fairly try to resolve the issues. In addition, and I know there is going to be even further clarification, we remove Sections 211G and 211I. The effect of both of those is to remove those elements which deal with the changes to the potential 
impacts on seniority in the event there is a need to lead to the termination of some employees. Hopefully, there is a way in which we can work and we recognize and support the concept which has been introduced earlier in the bill to send over the FERS and combined USPS pension surplus to the intention to the extent that it can accurately be identified as a way to deal with personnel issues, including potentially even incentives for early, uh, you know, early retirement. So the mechanisms are in place. And then lastly, it looks at this $10 billion temporary line of credit. I think we all appreciate that it creates an opportunity for capital, but to the extent that this has been discussed and identified as some kind of a bailout, we continue to protect the taxpayers with the recognition that that line of credit is currently secured. It is secured with property that is owned by the Post Office. There is a recognition that as there is downsizing, there is going to be significant property which will also not be needed to be utilized, and therefore a requirement that that security, to the extent that there is dollars that are owed from that $10 billion, that the real estate that secures it uh, be sold or otherwise utilized in a manner to make the taxpayers whole. I think what it ultimately will do, Mr. Chairman, is remove a fair amount of the concerns, the very legitimate concerns people have that somehow in our effort to get to a resolution on this, we are abrogating the historic relationship that exists between management and labor, but we allow the management and the labor collectively to have the capacity to make the tough decisions that will allow us to create a vibrant and vital United States Postal Service moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes the ranking member. I will be very brief. Mr. Meehan, um, I am sure this is a good amendment. I, you know, we, we got, you, you spoke a little earlier, and I, and I really, um, and, and you made some comments about how you, know, you get things at the last minute. We, we got this seven minutes ago. And, I, and I'm, not, I'm not knocking you. I just want you to see it's, um, and it sounds like some good stuff in here. It sounds like some stuff that I could agree with. And um, but I've been trying to read it while I'm sitting here and listening to you at the same time. Um, so that will be the extent of my comments. I'll give this to the gentleman. Just, I, I appreciate that, uh, Mr. Cummings. And, and the reality is, uh, you know, worked on this through the late hours of last night and up to negotiations this morning mm -hmm. before we walked out here in order to get and it. So the, the ability to put this together in language was really, we were negotiating this internally to try to find ways in which we can protect this process moving well, forward in a way which I think would appeal to allowing both sides of the aisle to find the capacity to really deal with the ultimate issue, which is for us all collectively to find a solution. And as I listened to what you had to say, and I um, read what I could read sitting here, it sounds like you're moving towards trying to, you know, bring some kind of compromise. And uh, the chairman said this is one that uh, the majority is going to accept. And so, but I hope that we will um, can. I mean, there may be some further things we can do with it regard to because it, it sounds like you're definitely going in the right direction. I just want to make sure that we have that chance to dialogue a little bit further. Thank the gentleman. The gentleman for Ohio, Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to speak about Mr. Meehan's uh, amendment and uh, I think uh, the importance of it. Um, and, and also, I have a question. Um, so first, I, I think it is very thoughtful to take a, a period of time at which the authority can be advisory. Uh, that is an important uh, period of, of interaction where um, you know, hopefully innovation can take hold rather than uh, just the uh, prescriptive measures of the bill. And that is where my question goes. My understanding is that this amendment uh, in paragraph B that says for the first control period that it shall be for two fiscal year, years that the uh, authority is in advisory capacity. When I, when I look to um, Section 214 on delivery port modernization, it actually comes into force if you look at line 17. It says the authority shall during the first control period 
take such measures as may be necessary, and then it goes on to, to, uh, to state that um, how the uh, delivery point modernization effects will come into place where um, you are going to um, eliminate door-to-door eliminate, um, -door de delivery for a good portion of the Postal Service's customers. I want to make certain that this amendment delays the effects of that for a two-year period, even though line 17 says first control period. And I want to thank the Chairman, because when this bill first was presented, the ending door-to-door -door delivery service under this provision was mandated even separate from the authority. I appreciate the Chairman moving it into the authority so that we can have the professional team that, that does that. I requested that, and I appreciate you having done it. So uh, this amendment, though, I, I want to support in that I believe, and with the confirmation from uh, staff, this delays for a two-year additional period the authority instituting the substantial end of door-to-door -door delivery service. Is that correct? That the gentleman will yield. Uh, I will speak on behalf of staff, not on behalf of the author. Uh, my staff assures me that if you go to page 2, line 6, what, what effectively the uh, staff writers have done for uh, Mr. Meehan is to choose to redefine the first period, which allows that two-year delay. So that was the reason. There were two ways to do it. We could, we could define a first period uh, conventionally and then have two years delay or simply define the first period. So that is what they, uh, they did, uh, and uh, we have been assured that technical corrections, if any, would be there, but that they are confident that this does exactly what you want. It is two years for the Board to be assembled. There is no delay in that process of selection, which we think is good to have them, uh, and the author uh, and I talked earlier, it is like a sort of Damocles. It is, look, we are here, we are ready, we will give you advice. But we are not going to do anything for two years, and if you have made the direction that we know you want to make, then, uh, then quite frankly, it never really comes into effect. And this is something that Mr. Meehan lobbied us very hard for, is the people that got you in, the trou in trouble, give them a chance to turn it around, uh, because a lot of us probably should have done more. You and I were here in 2006. We passed a bill that was insufficient uh, twice previously for the kind of reforms we are looking at today. So I think that is why Chair, they did it that way. Mr. Chairman, I, I appreciate uh, this. I have an amendment that I will be presenting later that goes to this, this issue of uh, what, what I think Mr. Meehan's amendment will do, as you are describing it, is to give a period of review where perhaps additional options can even be evaluated to where this one might not be necessary, although you know, it, it certainly is one that I think uh, you know, is, is set out very well as to its cost savings. Perhaps others could be pursued in the interim uh, that could avoid this. Uh, so, so, Mr. Meehan, I support your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your efforts on this. And then I will be presenting an amendment later that goes to that issue of um, looking for alternatives. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Does anyone else seek time? Uh, Mr. Platts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a secondary amendment to uh, the gentleman. The gentleman is recognized. The clerk will designate the amendment to the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Platts to the amendment offered by Mr. Meehan. Page 4, line 8, strike the closing quotation marks. Without objection. Uh, for everyone, just to be sure, this is a secondary amendment to an amendment, so we won't vote on the underlying Mr. Meehan amendment until we consider the secondary amendment. With that, the gentleman is recognized to explain his secondary amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, certainly uh, appreciate uh, Mr. Meehan's uh, efforts to um, strengthen the bill with his amendment and in working in conjunction with him to ensure that the language we have in the bill is um, uh, truly achieving what we are after here. And, and to summarize uh, my secondary amendment is if um, in, in renegotiating a labor contract uh, and RIFs are able to occur, uh, that it will be where seniority does count. So as is traditional in a, in a union uh, operation, if there is going to be a layoff, um, your seniority uh, counts. And so the most junior uh, who's been there one year gets laid off before someone who's been there 20 or 25 years. Um, my amendment uh, achieves that uh, and makes it clear that the only way anything else could occur is if the bargaining unit, the union, agreed with the management to do something different. 
Would the gentleman yield? Yeah, gladly. We are prepared to accept the secondary amendment. Obviously, Mr. Meehan will make a final call. We find that, in fact, it, it, it appears to do exactly what uh, Mr. Meehan had, had lobbied for and asked to have written. Uh, it makes it clear that we're, we do not want to interfere with ordinary collective bargaining uh, in any way that we want to have uh, the parties negotiate the changes that they find advantageous to the overall good of the organization. Yeah. Uh, would, you, would the gentleman yield, yield? yield to the gentleman? Yeah. Well, I, I thank you for taking the time, and I think the clarification is well defined. I mean, the real objective here is to is to allow the real work to take place that enables the leadership in concert with the workers to manage the place in a way that gets it to a financially secure circumstance. Uh, but doesn't turn around the mechanisms that they would have normally for dealing with the situation which we might all face, which is that there's going to have to be some, there may be some reductions in force. What I wanted to see was that the issue was we're trying to find a way to get to the problem. And we don't change traditional structures which are recognized. The, when I was with the Justice Department, when we had to meet a budget, the solution was that if you didn't get it, there was a RIF and it went a RIF and there was seniority and those things were associated. And I think we want to recognize the same procedures that are, that are identified in other agencies of government and not trying to be doing it in a different way. Yeah. Uh, yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Lynch is recognized to speak on the uh, secondary amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, look, I, I, I want to say First of all, I, I understand completely uh, the spirit in which this amendment, both amendments, uh, have been offered. And to Mr. Meehan and Mr. Platts, I, 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 I truly think that your amendments under the circumstances are well intended and, uh, and, and I agree with them. However, let me just say that you know, less than 90 days ago, the Postal Service sat down with the American Postal Workers Union. And in, supposedly, in good faith, they negotiated an agreement going forward for the next four years. And here we are. The ink is not even dry on that agreement. And the postal workers, to their credit, took some tough concessions in that agreement. They took some tough, tough uh, concessions. They went back to their membership and they said, look, the Postal Service is in a, a tough spot. We are going to have to absorb some sacrifice here. They went back to their members and their members ratified that contract in good faith. And, and what do we do? After they have ratified that contract for four years, I think they took zero the first year, zero the second year, then, then they get some increases down the line in the last couple of years of the contract. Now we are going to tear that up. We are going to lay them off. The underlying bill has the most senior employees getting laid off first. And, and, and the folks who are brand new and can't find the men's room or don't know which side of the stamp to lick, they are going to stay while the senior people leave. So I appreciate the amendment, what it does. It recognizes uh, seniority within that, within that system. I think both the gentlemen from Pennsylvania, uh, Mr. Platts and Mr. Meehan, uh, are on the, on the side of the angels on this one. But I, I do want to point out the, the, the unfairness in all of this that these folks sat down and negotiated an agreement to their own detriment. They gave up a lot. With the gentleman and, and now what is happening is, uh, is uh, we are ripping up that agreement and, and we are imposing uh, you know, unilaterally uh, some very, very severe conditions on them and on their families and on the retirees. Gentleman, yield. I would yield. Um, just, uh, just want to just add on to what you just said. You know, this, uh, one of the things that is very clear in this country is that the American people believe in fairness. And, you know, I, I will never forget the hearing that we had, and this gentleman right here sat there from the union, and I knew I could see the frustration in his, in his face because he talked about how they had given, the unions had given their blood, their sweat, their tears, that they understood sacrifice. They, they got it. And that they 
um, working with the Postal Service that shed, I think, over 100,000 employees over a three or four year period, and how he felt like they were constantly being squeezed and squeezed and squeezed to death. And I think what you just said is so significant in that, you know, you sit down, you bargain in good faith. Uh, every time our employees, our government employees, hear sounds coming out of Congress quite often, they are negative. But then they, and they say, well, wait a minute, you know, uh, we just bargained. It, I mean, it was just a few months ago, we bargained, and, and now this is what you're doing to us. The base bill itself changes the, this whole situation, you understand. And so at some point, I think we, we, we have to begin to also ask about the question of fairness, and that's what you, you're talking about, what, what's fair and what is right. And there's another piece to this. When you have, in this day and time, folks who get it, and say that we will, we understand that we've got some difficulty and some problems, as our unions do, have done. And they say, we, you know, we, we, we're going to make the sacrifices. Okay, we're going to do that. And then they make the sacrifices, and then they get kicked in the teeth. There's something wrong with that picture, something awfully wrong with that picture. And, Mr. Meehan, as I said before, I understand, you know, where you're coming from. And I know that you're a man of fairness. And I know Mr. Platt's... So I listened to Ms. Platt a little bit earlier. I was thinking, you know, all of this calls for us really sitting down and piece by piece actually really working through this like a heart surgeon doing the most complex surgery as opposed to just sort of put, moving along. And I'm not talking about kicking anything down, down the road. I'm talking about us actually sitting down and going through this and keeping in, in mind that there are people, when we do the things that we're doing here, there are people who are affected. There are families that are affected. There are neighbors that are affected. There are constituents that are affected. There are, there, there are male man and woman affected. I would say we can do better. I yield back. The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. The essence of what we're trying to do is work in a way in which we appreciate the issue of collective bargaining and what has been done to this point in time. I mean, this is an outreach to give the unions the appreciation and recognition for what they've done and, and what they've given in. One of the issues we also need to face, and we're all here collectively, is the math. Is the math. I mean, we look down the road and they do not have to do layoffs. This opens the position that they could be authorized if necessary. Let's hope that there is a way in which it doesn't need to be done. What it's doing, though, is enabling that to be a mechanism. But I'm looking at the math, and I'm struggling for a way to try to protect as many of the workers as we can and to protect their rights as best we can, but also we've got to protect the taxpayers. Because that, to the extent that this does not the post office cannot find its way to make itself able to operate on a, an even keel. The taxpayers are going to be told that they've got to pay for it. And they didn't have a place at that table. The very people who did have a place at that table were asking now to go back and find a way to make it work. The management that negotiated with that, given that two-year window, make it work. This is really an effort to try to appreciate what labor has done and to include them in the process so that we can get people to find the best way. I, I would yield. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, the, final point there is, uh, the gentleman's final point there is that of, uh, of trying to give an additional two years for all the parties to work together before there is even the possibility of a control board coming in. But to the, to the main point, that the gentleman from Massachusetts has raised, I think, a valid one about um, that the parties negotiated a contract just a few months ago, and, and this just changed one aspect of that, the, the RIF prohibition in the existing contract. In, in the gentleman's amendment, it allows or requires that to be taken out, but as part of a new negotiation. So the, the union made concessions in order to get that. 
um, when they renegotiate, it is not just the RIF issue that will be on the table, but any other concessions that they may have given up, maybe now they are going to say, hey, we are not going to give up that since we no longer have the RIF prohibition. So it, it is to try to have, as, as the ranking member said, a, a good faith negotiation is what I think the gentleman is after, that labor and management will negotiate a new contract. Uh, so some of what they conceded before, they may not concede this time because they are going to lose that prohibition um, on, uh, on RIF. So with that, I yield back to the gentleman. Oh, would the gentleman yield? Uh, Mr. Meehan, under your amendment, if I understand correctly, during negotiations, they, the union could negotiate, for example, substantial payments for people who were rifted because, in fact, it wasn't in their original contract. They could negotiate other concessions or even relook at their base pay and escalations. All of that would be on the, on the, under the table under your amendment, wouldn't it? Uh, Mr. Chairman, that is exactly what we are trying to do, is to go back to appreciate the, the principles of collective bargaining and to say that you know, we have got to all realize that at some point in time there may be a need to look at reduction in force, that there be an equitable way to do it, and that in return for what was negotiated, they can open the door to you know, renegotiation. And it would not be equitable to have prospectively three of the other remaining uh, unions that have not yet negotiated their, their contracts to be subjected to no layoff, to be subjected to clauses which could include layoffs, and yet have one of the unions uh, not have any kind of a layoff capacity. And I just don't, I'm hopeful, but I don't see the numbers. I'm hopeful that nobody needs to be laid off. It would be in the perfect world we didn't. But if they do need to, how do you do it most equitably? And that's the intent and hope of this provision. I thank the gentleman. Do you yield back? Yes, I do. The I gentleman yield back. yields back. <clears throat> As no further members are seeking recognition, the question is on agreeing to the secondary perfecting amendment offered by the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Platts. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The secondary amendment is agreed to. The question now appear, occurs on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Meehan. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Are there any further amendments? The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, is recognized for an, uh, to offer an amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2309, offered by Mr. Connolly of Virginia. Mr. With the unanimous consent that it will be considered as read, the gentleman is recognized to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment strikes Title I, II, and III and replaces them with a requirement that the Postal Regulatory Commission examine and consider recalibrating the rate at which the Postal Service prefunds its retirement health benefits for current employees. This is separate from the issue we discussed and debated a little earlier. This one doesn't involve competing GAO estimates. This is something we actually did in the 2006 legislation here in Congress. As a result of the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act of 2006, the Postal Service is the only entity, public or private, which is required to prefund pre -fund its anticipated retirement pension and health costs at 100 percent. That is far more than the industry norm, which we like to cite as a model of between 67 and 80 percent for public entities and is particularly unnecessary in light of the rapidly shrinking postal workforce. This requirement is the primary reason for the Postal Service's pending technical default. But for the prefunding requirement, the Postal Service would have been in the black since 2006 instead of losing a cumulative $22 billion. That is not to deny there are changes, obviously, in mail service. And as you pointed out earlier, Mr. Chairman, Obviously, the email, uh, email uh, is having an impact on, on the Postal Service, but it is a separate issue. This amendment would direct the Postal Regulatory Commission to recalculate the retirement prefunding rate based on industry best practices and expected changes to the Postal Service workforce. According to the Fitch Rating Service, government default rates nationwide are less than 0.03 percent, far lower than the private default rate of 10 percent. 
by aligning retirement prefunding requirements with the same best practices that have protected solvency of other governmental entities, we can also protect the Postal Service retirement savings without driving it into bankruptcy through excessive payment requirements. It would buy the Postal Service time to complete more far-reaching changes to its business model, including strategic co-location with public and private sector entities, maximizing revenue from parcel shipments associated with Internet commerce, vote by mail, advertising changes, and new retail activities with existing private sector companies in collaboration. Uh, in conjunction with the 90-day extension bill introduced by Mr. Cummings, Mr. Lynch, myself, and others, this amendment, I think, would buy us some time to fashion that new viable business model for the 21st century. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I recognize myself in opposition to this amendment. Mr. Connolly, you represent too many Federal workers not to know better. This, this amendment of yours guts the bill strikes all of the reforms and puts $100 billion on the backs of the American people if enacted. I know that the popular buzzword on both sides uh, of, of Capitol Hill has been, well, this we are the only agency that has to prefund. With all due respect, this is the only agency that gets to set its own fees and collect the money necessary to meet that funding. What I think is not said enough around here to pass the Federal Beltway to the American people is, in fact, Social Security has an obligation to be fully prefunded. We are prefunding our own retirement as individual citizens. Yes, the Federal Government, in fact, should have a line item for every part of the FERS liability. But ultimately, for everybody virtually except the Post Office, that would simply mean that we would put money in and then immediately put it back into Treasury bills. The difference is it is not general revenue that pays for the retirement of our postal workers. Now, I want to take exception specifically to one thing you said, that somehow because the post office is shrinking, this is less necessary. It is just the opposite. If the post office were growing, growth covers many ills. A larger post office in the future would be able to have more and more people to defray the cost of catch-up for people on retirement who had not been fully funded. That is not the case. As we go from 600,000 employees to probably 300 employees a decade, 300,000 employees a decade from now, it will be on the backs of their work and the uh, the remaining people using postal. So I could not disagree with this more. This strips away any reform, including the reforms agreed to uh, with our counterparts in the Senate, as necessary. I urge the opposition to this as not a sensible reform and yield back. I recognize the gentleman from uh, Maryland, the ranking member. Thank you very much. I would yield to Mr. Connolly to respond to uh, this, the uh, Chairman's uh, comments. I thank the ranking member. Um, I wish I could say I even appreciated the comments of the Chairman in response to my amendment. I guess some of us get under his skin more than others. Um, certainly lecturing me about I should know better in my district, frankly, is gratuitous. Um, we can deal with the merits of the amendment. The fact of the matter is no other agency is required to have 100 percent prepayment. That is a fact. And the only reason the Postal Service does is because of 2006 legislation that was generated by the United States Congress. And I am simply saying let's encourage the Postal Regulatory Commission, which, of course, the Chairman's bill would gut and essentially take away powers to oversee. Uh, because sometimes they come up, apparently, with recommendations with which we don't agree. But I would empower them to recalibrate what is a reasonable rate. If they want to come back and say, no, 100 percent is reasonable, then so be it. But I don't think the chairman of this committee or even this committee ought to substitute itself for a, a robust, rigorous analysis of what makes sense. I do contend 100 percent arbitrarily put in that legislation in 2006, a requirement no other agency has to meet and, and does not meet private sector standards, um, is unreasonable and puts an undue financial burden on the Postal Service. And so my simple amendment, yes, would change that and would actually, instead of our substituting our whimsical judgment on this matter, would actually put it in the hands of rigorous analysis by which we would abide. And with that, I yield back to the uh, ranking member. The gentleman yield. I would yield to the gentleman. 
Okay. Thank you. Uh, I, I just want to uh, uh, amplify a point made by uh, the gentleman from Virginia. What he's saying is that that uh, the prefunding uh, requirement is 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 especially uh, offensive given the shrinking nature of of the United States Postal Service workforce. And, and here's his point, and I and I totally agree with it. Unlike Social Security, which was used as a comparison, uh, you don't uh, the the health benefits of retirees in the postal system are based on years of service. You don't just get your quarters and then you qualify or age in. Uh, in this case, over the last four years, we had 100,000 postal employees leave. Okay, uh, Many of those were not qualified, not eligible for full uh, retiree benefits. We're, we're currently considering another 100,000 that would leave by early retirement. And then there will be another 100,000 that the, PM, the Postmaster General wants to lay off through RIF or some other fashion. Out of those 300,000 employees who will not be with the Post Office anymore, many, many of those will not qualify for retiree benefits, full retiree benefits, out of that 300,000 that have left. And yet we are, we are requiring the Postal Service to fund the retiree health benefit plan as if all those 300,000 employees worked the full 30 years and got full retiree benefits. That is the point that my friend is trying to make. And the fact that it is shrinking and there will be many, many, many employees who will leave without vesting uh, in terms of their, their retiree health benefits, that is where that, that gap uh, becomes even more uh, pronounced. So, uh, with that, I just I yield back. But I support the gentleman's amendment. I support the gentleman's amendment, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. No further individuals wish to speak. The question now occurs on the amendment by the gentleman from Virginia. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Gentleman from Virginia. I, I would respectfully request a recorded vote on that. A recorded vote is, uh, is uh, requested, and it will be postponed pursuant to the committee rules. Are there any further amendments? Thank amend you, Chair. Uh, we have an amendment on this side. Mr. Turner is recognized to offer his amendment. Mr. Chairman, I have three amendments at the desk, and I request unanimous consent to offer all three amendments, and I promise to be able to do that within the five-minute time. Will the amendment. gentleman be offering them in block? If that is acceptable, yes, please. Without objection, so ordered. The clerk will designate the three amendments in block. Amendments offered on block to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2309, offered by Mr. Turner of Ohio. Uh, the unanimous consent that all three amendments be considered as read, uh, assuming they are all distributed. Uh, the gentleman is recognized to explain his three amendments. The First Amendment, Mr. Chairman, is to Section 211, and it uh, provides a preference uh, for hiring. It applies to any contract for goods or services entered into the Postal Service. Uh, my amendment establishes a higher pref hiring preference for Postal Service employees whose jobs may be lost under provisions of this bill. It is limited in scope and reflects the Federal Government's commitment to sensible solutions. The men and women employed by the Postal Service ensure that important and time-sensitive items are delivered on time, helping businesses and customers effectively operate and communicate. But it is not these employees, not the letter carrier making daily rounds together and deliver mail, and not the branch employee helping customers who brought us to the brink of postal insolvency. Uh, it is the mismanagement of the hands of the Postal Service's bureaucrats. Uh, I offer this amendment to encourage my colleagues to support the Postal Service employees in, in establishing this preference. The Second Amendment uh, goes to uh, page 62, line 20. In looking to the issue of uh, limiting door-to-door -door service, we ask the authority to take into consideration a number of items. One is high-density population. One is uh, poverty areas and historic value. I am asking that the historic value be amended to include a registered historic district as a neighborhood, that that be considered in its sensitivity. Uh, my third amendment goes to the issue of um, 
lowering uh, door delivery points, uh, asking for a report on the cost effectiveness if it is to be employed, and I believe more importantly, the last portion of that amendment, asking the authority itself uh, to report to Congress whether or not limiting door-to-door uh, -door delivery is feasible, cost-effective, and would not otherwise be detrimental to the mail delivery uh, policy of the Postal Service, reporting to Congress if there needs to be a change in the recommended door-to-door -door delivery modernization procedures, and whether or not there's other authorities that they need to increase the flexibility, um, and uh, whether or not they agree or would request a postponement of further consideration of limiting door-to-door -door delivery. Those are the three amendments. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman yields back. I recognize myself. We are prepared to uh, accept your amendments. Uh, I find each of them to be narrow and yet meaningful. I am particularly supportive of your recognition that historic districts need to be considered. Uh, we here in Washington, although none of us are residents except the gentlelady, who, uh, the delegate, uh, we do recognize that there are 100, 150-year-old buildings. Uh, and it may be very difficult uh, to find solutions there, and I would yield to the well, gentleman. Yield. Also, I would like to ask for unanimous consent to offer an amendment to this en bloc amendment to add um, the um, we are adding uh, registered historic districts to also add the National Register of Historic Places. There will be an individual building, for example, Thomas Jefferson's home um, as being an exception. Is he still getting mail? Um, I am certain someone is there, but I, I wouldn't account. Without objection, so ordered. I yield back. The gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized. I would just caution, uh, you know, we are going to have to, we have got 37,000 postal facilities out there. Uh, if we start building walls up around certain classifications, whether it is a historic district or not, uh, I think it is important that we understand that it is people who are being served. and. Uh, each district will be different. You will know, have some areas that are being served by our rural letter carriers right now that uh, you know, are paid by piecework, which means the volume of the mail goes down, their pay goes down. Uh, you have poor urban areas where, uh, you know, and, and poor rural areas where a post office is really the, the heart of those communities. And I would just caution the gentleman, if we are going to load it up, with uh, you know requirements that historic so-called historic districts, I got historic districts where not a whole lot of people live, but it'd be nice to keep it open if we could. I'd hate to see that traded away and have. Well, it, and well gentlemen, yield. This isn't about post offices. It's about post office boxes at people's houses. It's about mail door to door delivery. That this provision does not keep open any post offices. It's just the issue of having the sensitivity to areas where there is a reduction in door-to-door um, -door delivery. And I, I think um, the comments that you are making actually support the amendment. Um, if the gentleman would yield, uh, if the gentleman would yield. Well, you are talking about still servicing certain areas and not servicing others. No, no. If the gentleman would yield. Oh, yeah, sure. I'll, th I'll thank yep. you. Yep. As the committee understands the amendment, for example, in historic Williamsburg, they would have to find a way to put in cluster, assuming you were living in historic Williamsburg, they would have to find a way to make the cluster box or mailbox consistent with the fact that it would look wrong to just have a bunch of mailboxes in the middle of a historic 1700s uh, facility. In the case of here on the Hill, for example, they, they might not have a mailbox sitting out at the street with our limited curbs. The gentleman's amendment does require that it might cost a little more to get it right with these historic communities, and that is what he is looking at. In some cases, if I understand correctly, it may not be cost competitive. It may be better just to walk up and put it in the door at Thomas Jefferson's home at Monticello. But that, that is our understanding, and the underlying bill did have a 90 percent, not a 100 percent goal. So although it could affect the consideration for that last 10 percent, 3.7 million homes that might not end up with a, 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 an outside box, it, it, we, we accepted his amendment in principle because we felt that it simply put the priority where it belonged uh, in the consideration. But it do, as far as we know, it doesn't affect post offices. I yield Mr. back. Mr. Chairman, if you yield for just a moment. Well said. 
Does the gentleman yield back? The question now occurs on the amendment, the en bloc amendments uh, to the amendment in the form of a substitute. All those in favor of the amendments signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Are there any further amendments? Chairman. The, he beat you out. The gentleman from Illinois is recognized, Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment with Representative Braley and wish to offer that amendment at this time. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2309, offered by Mr. Davis of Illinois and Mr. Braley of Iowa. We ask unanimous consent the amendment be considered as read and recognize the gentleman from Illinois for his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, my amendment will strike Section 311 of the bill. In my view, Section 311 is a draconian proposal and establishes a terrible precedent in creating a separate workers' compensation program for postal workers that would have devastating impact to them. As a former postal employee, I personally know these jobs are some of the most labor-intense jobs in the Federal Government. Injured workers at no fault of their own deserve fair and adequate compensation. And this provision raises serious questions about losing the protections currently provided for in FICA. We are concerned about the finances of the Postal Service, yet I believe that mandating the Postal Service to create its own workers' compensation program begs the question of how we can expect this financially strapped Postal Service to pay for its cost. Is this a move to privatize the workers' compensation program? At a time when we are experiencing the most difficult financial times since the Great Depression, one would have to ask the question, would this drive hardworking Americans to the unemployment rolls? And finally, Mr. Chairman, we all want a healthy postal service, but a key component is the workers. Any changes to be made impact in these workers should be seriously thought out, seriously analyzed, and then whatever decisions that get made should take place. Workers' compensation is one of the most important protections that workers have in this country. And I believe that we can't just take a, a whack and expect the Postal Service, which becomes a very smaller uh, entity, to establish a program of its own and expect the same kind of protections for the workers that they get as a part of the overall government compensation system that we have. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. The Chair would announce that at the rate we are going, we believe that we will be able to have votes on the base bill by 4. Uh, so if all members, uh, all staffs would announce to them to be prepared to be here at 10 minutes to 4, that is our goal. If, if, we, if we go slower than expected, then the, vote will be, the votes will be after the, uh, uh, the, the Korea uh, joint session. But right now I want people to be at least aware that that could occur. And with that, uh, I'll recognize, uh, does anyone wish to speak in opposition? Okay, then I will. I recognize myself for five minutes. The, uh, the amendment of the gentleman from Illinois, although well-meaning, uh, strikes our attempt to deal with FECA. Uh, I recognize that there is no perfect language, and we had a lively discussion at the subcommittee. However, not only will this amendment eliminate some of the savings, but it will leave absolutely no answer for the three 98-year-old people who still receive pay because they have failed to, uh, 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 to deal with this. 
what I would say to the gentleman from Illinois in opposition to this bill is it is my goal to work with Mr. Miller, ranking member on, on uh, education and workforce, and Mr. Klein to see if we can't find mutually ex uh, agreeable language. Having said that, we have been notified by the Senate, most notably uh, the ranking member over there, uh, uh, Senator Collins, that they have jurisdiction and they intend on doing something on it. So uh, without speaking as much to the, uh, uh, the, the, the core, I think that the gentleman would agree with me that no action by striking this does leave us with some unanswered problems that will ultimately be in the final bill. So it is not that I object to working on it, and I look forward to working with the gentleman, but would ask that uh, this, this amendment not be approved, and I yield back. Seeing no further Mr. debate, Chairman, yes, the, I wanted to, uh, to yield to the gentleman. Did you have a uh, response, Mr. Davis? I want to thank the ranking member for yielding. The reality is, Mr. Chairman, and I, I certainly appreciate uh, your desire and your willingness to work with uh, Ed and Labor to try to reach a common ground. But in the meantime, what we are really saying is that we are going to zero this out, wipe it out, and, and indicate that those workers would have not the protection of all the rest of the workers in our system. And, uh, of course, the Postal Service, while it is a large uh, organization, I don't think is large enough to sustain at the same level the kinds of protections for workers that they currently have under a system. And while I agree that there need to be some changes in terms of super I guess annuaries, that is, individuals who have reached certain ages uh, wondering what to do with them, I think that we ought to be able to find a way to take them out of the system and not do damage to the rest of the workforce. With the ranking member, I yield, I yield to the gentleman. Uh, I agree that we should be able to find it. What our base text does is it provides uh, because of the amendment delaying the control board, it provides two years in which they would not be able to opt out of FECA. And during that time, while well, they were proposing that for their, let's call it, 500,000 workers, they would have a system, at the same time, uh, the Congress has the opportunity to act on an alternative. My goal would be, and I think the appropriate goal we should all have, is that FECA reform would occur. The, something that is within our committee's uh, partial jurisdiction, but primarily in the Ed and Labor uh, Committee. So the goal is, in fact, to leave a place marker here, and I hope that the gentleman would, would view that saying that they have the power two years from now to develop their own system and leave FECA doesn't mean that they have to do it. It means that if we can't find a fix in two years, if it saves them money while being fair to their uh, injured employees, they would have the ability to do it. And that is the only reason that I, I spoke to the gentleman's amendment. I actually would hope that you would withdraw your amendment and work with me on getting to that final language along with uh, Mr. Miller and Mr. Klein uh, over at the Committee of Primary Jurisdiction. Are you also the gentleman? Uh, and again, I want to thank the ranking member for yielding. Um, in, in, in the spirit of good faith and based upon the conversation and discussion, that we have had, I will, in fact, uh, withdraw the amendment and look forward to working with you and Ed and Labor to see if we can find an amenable agreement under which the individuals could be protected. I yield to the gentleman. I thank the gentleman and uh, ask unanimous consent to be withdrawn. The amendment is withdrawn. How would and, you, I, and I do look forward to working with you on that. Uh, to the, to uh, Mr. Davis, um, we will, we will do everything in our power to address this issue. As I said from the beginning, we have to have, this really needs to be a bipartisan effort. Um, I understand exactly what you are attempting to do. I think it is a good thing, and we have just got to figure out how to do it in a way that, you know, that works for all, for all folks. And, but thank you very much. And, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your offer to uh, resolve this issue. I thank you. I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. We now recognize the gentleman from New from Brooklyn for an amend for the purposes of an amendment. Chairman, I'm sorry. We, we yes. go 
I have another amendment. Uh, well, I guess you didn't get the first one. I might as well give you another one. If that's okay with the gentleman from Brooklyn. I'd be delighted to yield to him. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Illinois for the purpose of an amendment. Well, Clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2309, offered by Mr. Davis of Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. Gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment to strike Section 403 of H.R. 2309. Section 403 will phase out postage rates that facilitate the ability of nonprofit organizations, churches, and other faith-based institutions to effectively do charitable work in America in helping the poorest and the neediest people. Given this tight economy and high unemployment, nonprofit organizations and faith-based institutions are called upon to do more to ease the burden of our citizens afflicted with diseases, mental and physical disabilities, disaster, drug addictions, reentry, homelessness, and poverty. How can we expect these organizations who provide so much assistance to others be called upon yet to share again a high cost burden that tax their efforts? This is just not fair, and I don't think it is the right thing to do. We must be cognizant of how Section 403 rate preferences for nonprofit advertising of H.R. 2309 will impact our nonprofit and faith-based organizations who receive charitable contributions from the average citizen to help others. For example, this provision would cost the March of Dimes Foundation an additional $1 million in postage expenses in its first implementation. As a result, the Foundation would have to drastically cut mail volumes across the board, which in turn would mean dramatic loss in donor support. And as we know, the March of Dimes direct mail program is the second largest source of funding within the organization, which provides life-saving research efforts for women infants and children. Last year, the, infant, the American Lung Association mailed about 40 million pieces of mail that cost approximately $6.3 million in postage. Section 403 would equate to a rate increase for the American Lung Association by 35 percent. According to the American Lung Association, this imposed rate hike would significantly cut back their mail volume and significantly reduce their donations to fund research projects to improve treatments and find cures for more than 37 million Americans. There are many more examples of how Section 403 can hinder the efforts of many nonprofit and faith-based institutions. And let me reiterate the importance for not supporting this provision. The Congress established non profit postage rates in 1951. Those preferred nonprofit rates have been reauthorized by Congress and various Presidents until this day, 60 years later. The reason is simple. Nonprofit organizations provide needed support and services for the American people, programs that government cannot and will not provide. In these difficult economic times, nonprofits are being called upon to provide even more support. And so, given the fact that they serve such a viable function, I don't believe that we need to raise the rates for them to communicate with their donors. I would urge support for this amendment, Mr. Chairman, and yield back the balance. Gentlemen, yield. Yield. Um, the, you, you can go ahead. I'll yield. Okay. Uh, if the gentleman would yield. Mr. Davis? You and I think more alike than you can imagine. Uh, we have an amendment which we have shown to uh, your leadership that goes most of the way there. It takes the existing immediate, uh, makes it three years, and then at that point, if there is still a deficit, would phase it in more slowly at 2 percent. Uh, if you take that as a friendly secondary, we would support your effort to uh, not have any burden until we can get those costs in line, as you so rightfully said. Well, Mr. Chairman, I am delighted that we do, in fact, have some of the same thinking patterns 
And I would certainly accept uh, that response and be delighted to do it. Then I will take that as a unanimous consent on the secondary being accepted. All those in favor of accepting Mr. Davis's text as amended, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it, the ayes have it, and the clerk will Pardon me. Oh, noting for the clerk that the agreed on language was uh, number 105, TRC 105. So you can catch up on those technical corrections. Thank you. The, uh, we now go to Mr. Lankford for the purpose of offering an amendment. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate. Mr. Lankford, which one? This deals with the uh, appeal rights. The of, number uh, on the top left. Uh, let's see, 133. Thank you. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2309, offered by Mr. Langford of Oklahoma. The gentleman is recognized to explain his amendment. Thank you. I will be very brief with it. Uh, we all understand very well post offices, whether it be a branch or whether it be a station, uh, they are community locations. In many rural communities, that is the only flagpole in that entire area, and for many places, uh, that is the gathering location. And so ways to be able to honor those rural communities and be able to allow the community to be as involved as possible with the possibility in the future that there may be consolidation of stations. I want to have every opportunity possible for the community to be involved in that conversation. Currently, post offices can be appealed and they can have community involvement in that appeal, but branches and stations cannot. While they are smaller, more remote, have fewer staff on them, I do consider those as still that community station for that location. So this simply provides an opportunity uh, that it expands the appeal process for the closure of a facility beyond just post offices to postal stations and to branches as well. Would, would the I, gentleman yield? Yes, I would. Uh, we are prepared to accept this amendment as an amendment, <clears throat> quite frankly, that uh, we would not have, have seen otherwise this uh, technical in inequality in the appeal right. So I think it is a good amendment. I think it reflects uh, a balance that we have on this committee of both rural members and urban members, each recognizing that we have to treat their constituencies fairly and yield back. Thank you. With that, I would yield back my time as well. Thank you. Does anyone else seek time? The gentleman from Brooklyn. No, no, no. We have got to finish this one first. Uh, does anyone wish to speak on the Langford Amendment? The gentleman from Massachusetts. Can I ask the gentleman from Oklahoma? What, what was recognized. What would the uh, what would the appeal rights consist of at this point? Appeal rights would be the same as the post office. Uh, currently, if you are a station or a branch, you don't have the same appeal rights uh, right. because they are a smaller location. If there is a closure or, or a combination, it only in the law it only says that you have an appeal right if it is a post office. So they define it different if it is a postal station or a postal branch office. And, uh, so if there is no postmaster that actually works there, uh, then they have a separate type of appeal and it is not as thorough. Right. I am just concerned, uh, you know, with, with uh, 200,000 less employees, we're, we're probably going to have to close some places. Uh, Unfortunately, that is what I am afraid of as well. But I just want to make sure when they do it, we do it judiciously. Well, yeah, absolutely. I am just, uh, you know, I think some of those areas are going to be urban, some are going to be suburban, rural. Uh, and, you know, I, I just think that sometimes you are going to have to trade off within your own district in terms of uh, closing one and keeping one open. Right. Uh, and I, I just think it is going to be extremely difficult under current law to close anything. That is part of the problem. I think we are going to, you know, every week we are naming new post offices. I think we will run out of names before we run out of post offices. And uh, I just think we are putting obstructions in our way. And, well, I, it, you know, I, I understand what your interest is here. But I also understand that we are going to have to close some facilities somewhere around the country. Would the gentleman yield? I absolutely would. Uh, I thank the gentleman. Isn't it true that currently there is a voluntary process that looks a lot like an appeal but is not mandated in the law, and this is the process that allows people to say this one should be kept and maybe not this other one? That, that is correct. It's my understanding that there is an appeal process that is already done voluntarily. Uh, this would just codify that so people would know. Uh, how they can get a chance to get input. Again, I, for most people in my district, and we are dealing with post office closings like everyone else is, 
they just want to have an opportunity to be able to say their piece and to be able to know I'm being heard. And the postmaster and the, and the folks in our area have been very good about listening to people and considering and reconsidering and getting all the facts. This allows all the facts to get out there and so that someone doesn't make a decision separate from the facts and the details in the community. No, I, I, if the gentleman would yield, I, I think that's a fair, fair point. I, and I'm not, uh, I'm not saying that that democratic process is, is, is uh, inappropriate. I think it is. I would, in my bill, I had actually asked that members uh, be consulted before uh, they pick a post office that you may know is, is a, a key location, but the post office for some reason wants to close it. We had a number of those cases last year and the year before where the Postal Service went off and started closing down facilities that were incredibly important to minority communities, right. and uh, th there was not the give and take. So I appreciate the, the, the uh, the desire to get public involvement, I just uh, I would just caution that uh, if if you make appeal rights so strong that we don't close down anything, then we're 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 going to be in big trouble going forward. Would, That's would, all. Would the gentleman yield back as well? Sure, absolutely. I, I I completely concur. If we have to make closings, and it's apparent that we will in some areas. Uh, I just want to make sure that we have as much community involvement as we can. I have done the same thing in areas uh, in my own community. There is a station that we have been uh, working with the community leaders in an area, and it is an African American community in my district, and we have worked very hard to be able to protect that station that was being pulled off, it has now been reengaged. But I chose as a Congressman to engage in the same level as the rest of the community and to be able to put my information and to be able to engage and say, here are some things you should consider. And so I understand that as well. I have been fighting hard for stations in my area also. But I would say I am going to engage it with the community like everybody else. Okay. I appreciate that, and I, and I support the gentleman's amendment. Thank you. I thank the, uh, the question now occurs on the amendment of the gentleman from Oklahoma. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed, nay. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. We now recognize the gentleman from Brooklyn, New York, for his purposes of offering an amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2309, offered by Mr. Towns of New York. Thank you very much. Um, and I assure you, Mr. Chairman, I will not take up all the time. But since we are prepared to accept it, less would be better. Right. Well, on that note, then I would just like to say thank you for accepting my amendment. <laughs> with, with that, the question occurs on the amendment of the gentleman from New York. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Are there any further amendments? Mr. Murphy is recognized for the purpose of offering an amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I actually have two uh, amendments uh, at the desk. I think it is probably appropriate to consider them separately. The first is uh, Well, then I will recognize you separately. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Would you give the clerk the number that you want first? This is originally uh, a Norton 93 amendment. The clerk will designate the amendment Norton 93. Now, Murphy, too. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2309, offered by Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. The gentleman is recognized to offer his, or to explain his amendment. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this uh, amendment strikes, uh, primarily strikes two sections of the bill, uh, the two sections that set up uh, a rather extraordinary power for the new authority to uh, rewrite. Uh, collective bargaining agreements. Uh, we have had a lot of discussion about collective bargaining here, and so I won't go through a new song and dance uh, in defense of the principle. Uh, but uh, suffice it to say, as Mr. Lynch has said a number of times in this debate, and as Mr. Cummings has reiterated, um, we have had uh, a lot of angst and a lot of give and take over the last uh, year, especially with uh, one of the major employee unions for the Postal Service, in which they have given some major concessions. Uh, and this uh, provision in the bill, which in the case that the authority takes root, gives them the power to essentially abrogate collective bargaining agreements and rewrite them from whole cloth, 
is a unprecedented assault on the, I think, fairly fundamental premise of collective bargaining that we have talked a lot about here today. Um, and if I can draw just briefly upon some experiences we have had in Connecticut with the same type of power, I am sure that there is a, a lot of hopefulness and good faith on behalf of the majority in, in that uh, this section says that first the authority has to try to reach new agreements through traditional collective bargaining, and then should they not uh, reach uh, the desired outcome, then they can modify the contract in order to uh, fall within the desired uh, financial savings targets uh, that the authority has set. Um, we have gone through that process in Connecticut, a very painful process of several major cities being taken over by oversight boards run by the State. And uh, our statutes look very much like this, but the reality was very different. Uh, in Connecticut's case, the authority board really papered over the initial process of collective bargaining and then went right to rewriting uh, the contracts. And when they did that, though they were, as this statute requires them, supposed to stick to the portions of the contract that have financial ramifications, they essentially rewrote the contract uh, from the ground up, including lots of non-financial changes that had to do with work rules and worker protections and safety requirements. Uh, and this section of the bill, only about two pages long, uh, I would argue is woefully inadequate in setting up uh, some you know, basic restrictions on the powers that this new board would have to rewrite these agreements. I am sure there is a conversation to be had uh, about uh, a modification to contracts to keep it within certain uh, financial targets, uh, restrictions on non-financial uh, aspects. Uh, I don't see enough of that in this section. My uh, amendment would uh, strike uh, this power uh, on behalf of the authority to rewrite uh, the uh, agreement. Uh, I think this is wrongheaded, and as it is written now, I don't think it has any of the type of protections that uh, we would want, given this unprecedented power to essentially completely wipe out a collective bargaining agreement at the whim of this new authority. Uh, and with that, uh, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. I now recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Ross. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wish to, to speak in opposition to the amendment. Uh, today we have already we've, we've adopted the, uh, the Platts Amendment, the Meehan Amendment, which I think adequately addresses this with regard to collective bargaining. We have also unanimously adopted uh, Delegate N uh, Norton's amendment uh, with regard to the sense of the Congress for concerning uh, collective bargaining agreements. I, I think it's, it's, it's pretty um, important to point out that the collective bargaining agreements uh, need to be preserved to the extent that they can be preserved uh, as a last priority should they ever be touched or, or, or addressed. And I think that is what we have accomplished in the Meehan agreement or amendment is that the, uh, the, the collective bargaining agreements will be preserved uh, unless there is absolutely nothing less that can be done to save the United States Postal Service. I think one of the most important things that we have to look at as we pass this bill is where are the cost-saving measures and where can it come from? Can it come from going from, from uh, door to curb service of $3.5 billion reduction? Can it come from closing certain processing facilities? Can it come from closing certain post offices? Can it come from reducing the number of employees there, not by layoffs and not by uh, 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 firing them, but rather by incentivizing them for full of retirement which, for which 150,000 are, are eligible? If we can accomplish that, then the collective bargain agreements don't need to be addressed. But if we do have to address the collective bargain agreements, I believe that we have adequately done that in the Meehan and the Platts Amendment. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The question now occurs on the amendment, uh, in the amendment to the amendment in the form of a substitute by Mr. Murphy. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chairs, the noes have it. The noes have it. The agreement. The gentleman requests a, a roll vote. Uh, has been, a vote has been ordered pursuant to the rules. The, the vote will be postponed. Are there any further? Uh, yes, and for the further Second Amendment. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I never thought I would get a Second Amendment from you, but go ahead. Another amendment uh, at the desk. The clerk will designate. Murphy, 52. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2309 offered by Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. The gentleman is recognized to explain his uh, bill or his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in the uh, underlying bill uh, in the substitute amendment, there is a provision uh, that would eliminate the right of public appeal on the issue of closure or consolidation of a post office if there is a contract post office 
uh, within two miles. Uh, this uh, amendment simply would restore the ability of the public to appeal uh, that closure in the case that they have a uh, relatively nearby contract post office. Uh, at, at the root of this amendment is just the idea that every town and every city is unique, and there seems to be no harm in uh, it's simply allowing the public to make a case uh, that having a postal contract facility within two miles is inadequate. And that could happen for a variety of reasons. Uh, the layout uh, of uh, a town's postal infrastructure is different by uh, city and by municipality. And in some of my towns, for instance, we have uh, major cities with only two postal facilities, one postal facility and a contract facility. They happen to be both in the downtown area, probably about two miles away from each other, but serving totally separate sides of the town. And so the proximity of the two really has nothing to do with whether or not that area needs to uh, post offices. It needs two, one serving one area, one serving the second area. Second, uh, the uh, quality of these contract uh, post offices varies widely. Uh, and it seems appropriate to at very least allow the public to make the case that the contract post office that lies within two miles isn't sufficient, isn't adequately staffed, uh, doesn't have the degree and range of services necessary to compare uh, or substitute for the post office that's being closed. This is really an amendment just to, uh, just to restore a modicum of public uh, input. I think all of these situations are so different uh, as to merit and require uh, a public appeal uh, in order to make their case. Um, uh, I, I hope that uh, this amendment can be uh, agreed to. And with that, Mr. Chairman, well, gentlemen, yield. Back. I, gentlemen, I, yield. I, I, I yield. Thank you. Thank you. Um, shall be very brief. Um, you know, this amendment uh, at hand strikes Section 112C from the amendment in nature of substitute that deals with the appeals process for post office closures. As I said a little bit earlier, we. I think as we go through this process, we need to keep in mind that there are some people, some very important people who have a stake in all that, all this, and that is our constituents. Um, specifically, the amendment in nature of substitute would remove language that provides citizens and other postal stakeholders the opportunity to appeal the closure of a facility to the Postal Regulatory Commission. I can understand that. Um, but I think, as the gentleman stated, Mr. Murphy stated, uh, there are unique situations, and in so many instances already, uh, I've had Republicans and Democrats to come up to me, and I'm sure you have too, Mr. Chairman, uh, complaining and worrying about how they're going to keep their post offices open, and and basically saying that it's their constituents that are banging down the door. One of the things I think we always want to do is give the public an opportunity to have some kind of say. And I think that's what the gentleman is trying to do. Given the importance that many postal facilities hold, especially in rural America and smaller towns, it's important that Americans still have access to a full suite of legal options when they wish to appeal these closures. Through these appeal procedures, we can ensure that our constituents voices are heard and that their concerns are fully vetted. Postal reform is going to produce significant challenges for our constituents. Eliminating traditional and reasonable protections in the Postal Service's facility closure process certainly isn't going to ease these challenges. So I support the gentleman's amendment. And I would hope we can do this one uh, for our constituents. I thank, uh, I thank the gentleman. And uh, as he mentions, at the root of this bill is an acceptance that an appeal process is worthy, that that is an appropriate way for our constituents to make their voice heard. My suggestion is that this limitation on that appeal process is, is arbitrary, uh, that simply because you have a contract post office within two miles uh, should, shouldn't uh, eliminate the ability of that constituency to protest uh, a closure. Um, whether or not there is merit to their argument, well, that is up to the process to decide. But this limitation on a process established in the underlying bill just doesn't seem to make sense in a lot of jurisdictions that uh, you are going to come across. And with that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I recognize myself in opposition. Uh, although I will not forestall or, or, or close in any way the possibility that we can improve the various aspects of the, uh, the appeal process uh, between now and the time this becomes law. 
I do have concerns that the reason that we put in this very small area, and I know I'm a native of Cleveland, I live here in Washington part of the time, and I live in a suburban area in, in California, so I know that two miles in, in California is how far I go just to get a bottle of milk. Uh, well, two miles here, I go past 80 restaurants, uh, or maybe more, plus the White House. So the fact is, two miles is relative. We chose to, to feel that if the post office, in their effort, which is a stated effort to get to 24-7 opportunity by moving to contract to post offices that actually enhance the ability of the consumer to get there, uh, they are often going to put in a second post office, replacing one often a leased post office, closing that post office and saying, here is a substitute. Uh, I certainly would be happy to, uh, uh, in, in reporting this bill out, to include language asking the post office to give us an opinion of whether two miles is right, and I know we have one of the esteemed members of the postal leadership here today, uh, whether two miles should be one mile or it should be three miles. I am happy to look at that. But I think that although two miles was arbitrary, we tried to, tried to recognize that a substantially same community being serviced by a contract post office, often inside a 24-7 location, was something that the postmaster and his predecessor and the board have been moving for toward to give better service at a lower cost, and that as long as, as, long as we understand that, we understand why there would be a certain amount of you can't have, you can't have a, a long process every time they simply want to move to a better, newer system that happens to be contract. If you were building a new post office one mile from an old post office, everyone would understand there was no reason for it to have an extended process because the post office was simply finding a location that was better. I would, I would yield to the gentleman if he has a comment. Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with the expectation that I am probably going to lose this uh, amendment, uh, I, I would uh, certainly uh, entertain the offer to work on either language as the bill is reported out or uh, a subsequent conversation based on uh, some discussions with the post office. Uh, I will take your offer. You, you have it, and uh, you also had a head shake by the, uh, the Deputy Postmaster. So uh, we will try to find the right distance if, that's, if that distance is not there and work with you for final passage. With that, I will withdraw the amendment. I thank the gentleman. And with that, uh, are there any further amendments? The gentleman from Nebraska, Iowa. I always do that. I have done, done three different cities for you, Bruce. Uh, okay. We thank know. you. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chairman, we know when we are in flyover country that these are the things that happen, and we are just grateful to be here at the hearing with you. I thank the gentleman, and I assure you that two and a half hours from home as I fly over your district, I think of you. Uh, I actually have two amendments at the desk, Mr. Chairman. Uh, will the gentleman be offering them in block? I am not sure what the status of the second one is. We have been talking to your staff about it, so I would just ask the Chairman, to call up Amendment 30 at this time, and maybe we can go from there after we take care. The clerk will designate the Amendment Number 30. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2309, offered by Mr. Braley of Iowa. Uh, before the gentleman is recognized, it, it is clear that we will not be able to conclude prior to the, uh, the speech on the House floor. So we will go right until 4 o'clock. We will come back immediately following the speech. And at that point, we expect, with the relatively limited uh, amendments left, that we will roll. The roll votes will be voted very shortly after a return, and then the final two bills. So we would ask everyone to come back uh, immediately following the speech, and that would put us uh, out of here about 15 to 20 minutes after that. Uh, as a matter of fact, Mr. Braley, you will have the last amendment before we adjourn. Uh, the, the gentleman is recognized to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Every time you say the gentleman from Brooklyn, I think you are talking about me, because like Mr. Towns, I grew up in Brooklyn. I just happened to grow up in Brooklyn, Iowa. And one of the reasons I have introduced that amendment is because growing up in that small town and knowing the critical importance of rural post offices, um, I want to make sure that we are doing everything we can to keep those post offices open and as part of those communities, because as others have said, it is an incredibly important thing to those communities. My amendment strikes the BRAC-style commission that would close thousands of post offices across the country and strike the language that would also close nearly every rural and small town post office. The simple truth about this bill is that it would result in the closure of almost every small town and rural post office in America. 
It would weaken mail delivery to rural areas and lay off thousands of post office employees. These post offices provide good paying jobs. They ensure that the mail is delivered quickly. They are great meeting places and they support local businesses. And my constituents in the 1st District of Iowa rely heavily on them for their livelihoods. Closing these rural post offices would devastate many of these communities, put more people out of work, and hurt the local economy in thousands of small towns. That is why I believe in a better solution. Let's solve the post office's financial problems by passing the Lynch Plan, and then uh, I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. It would do several things. It would strike Subtitle A and Section 112 of the bill. Right now, according to the PRC, maintaining all small and rural post offices costs 0.7 percent of the total operating budget of the USPS. And Subtitle A mandates a 10-year savings of $8 billion, so to reach that total, virtually every small and rural post office would have to close. Subtitle A fails to account for the U.S. Postal Service with facility closures, and as a result, this will have a disproportionately adverse effect on rural communities. And that is why I urge my colleagues to support my amendment, and I yield. Would the gentleman yield? I will. Uh, I, I know the gentlelady uh, from New York intends to speak on this because she has worked hard with, uh, on a similar concern. Uh, I do hope that uh, the gentleman will, uh, uh, will recognize that the, the reforms we put in to limit to 10 percent the, uh, the closures that can occur within rural America is, was a good faith effort to try to address that. Uh, I also have been advised that your Second Amendment is perfectly acceptable to us in a revised form, so as soon as it is printed, we are ready to accept it. And with that, I yield back. You gentlemen yield back. I just want to thank the Chairman for acknowledging we both agree on the Second Amendment. <laughs> I thank the gentleman. Recognize the gentlelady from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to uh, reiterate our amendment this morning was specifically uh, introduced to, to protect the rural post office, and so there would not be an inordinate number of those closed, understanding that it would impose such a um, difficulty for folks who live in rural areas, and it was a, a consideration of that. Uh, and so I hope that uh, you will consider supporting that amendment. And uh, with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentlelady. The question now occurs on the amendment of the gentleman from Iowa. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed, nay. Nay. In the opinion of the chair, the nays have it. The nays have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Mr. Chairman. You would like a vote? Please, sir. Okay. It will be postponed. And with that, the gentleman is recognized for his second amendment. Uh, that is the O32. I do have it. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2309 offered by Mr. Braley of Iowa, but I have the only copy. So uh, don't I have? I have a second copy. Okay. <laughs> the gentleman is recognized to explain his amendment while they are circulating. I thank the chairman and just very briefly uh, would indicate that one of the things everyone is concerned about is the impact on the unemployment rate that closing post offices will have. And one of the ways that we have tried to address that is by requiring the Postal Service and the Commission on Postal Reorganization to consider the total number of postal employees who would lose their jobs, the total number of veterans who would lose their jobs, and the availability of both post office jobs and non-post office jobs in the area as part of any closing decision. Um, just today in CQ Today, there was a, an ad that says it all, the Postal Service hires more veterans than any other civilian employer. I am proud to be the ranking member on the Economic Opportunity of the Veterans Affairs Subcommittee. We have one out of every four Iraq and Afghanistan veterans unemployed, which is a shameful thing for this country to be facing. And we know that the Postal Service does a great job of putting veterans to work. We know that every veteran who completes the transition assistance program for service members, 45 percent of those veterans get a government job, many of them in the Postal Services, and that is why I am pleased that the Chairman has agreed to work with me in accepting this. Would the gentleman yield? I would. We are prepared to accept it. I believe it makes common sense for us to look at the impact 
your agreement to have it be on an annual basis makes it not an excess burden to the post office and with that if the gentleman will yield back we will call that question i would be happy to mister chairman with that the question is for all those in favor of accepting the gentlemans amendment please signify by saying aye opposed in the opinion of the chairs the aye have the ayes have it the ayes have it the amendment is agreed to with that all further amendments will occur as soon as we have a working quorum after the speech on the House floor for which the seats are disappearing fast. Could I just we, inquire of the Chair, how many uh, uh, roll call votes do we have right now? I'm about a 10, I guess, 8 or 9. Thank you. Uh, but anyone that wants to withdraw them and accept it, it is always in order. Uh, and with that, we stand in recess.